Hello, hello. As we continue on with part two of chapter 17, let's go ahead and take a look at our pancreas as well as what's happening with the gonads. All right, guys. So now let's take a look at our pancreas. And for the pancreas, what we see happening is that the pancreas is a mixed gland. So we are only going to be taking a look at the islets or the eyelids, as some people like to say. So if you take a look on the top part, you're going to see an insurgent of a histology picture. And you see that you have what we call the pancreatic islets, and we have our exocrine acenar cells. Those are the dark pink cells. We're going to concentrate on the little islet section because that's the part of the pancreas that will produce the hormones. The acenar section is what produces the digestive enzymes. So that would be an exocrine secretion. And since this is the endocrine chapter, we're more interested in the hormones. The alpha cells of the pancreas will go ahead and produce this hormone called glucogen. Glucogen is usually released in between meals when the person has a sensation of being hungry or the body requires additional glucose in its bloodstream. The release of glucogen will go ahead and cause the liver to stimulate gluconogenesis and glyconolysis. And these are two processes, as we've discussed before, that will cause the release of glucose into circulation. And as a respond, the blood, the blood glucose levels will increase. We also see that depending on the levels of glucogen that's released, your adipose tissue will also go ahead and activate fat catabolism, allowing the apetocytes, your little fat cells, to shrivel up and release the additional energy that they have been housing. So the effect of glucogen is that it will go ahead and cause an increase in your blood glucose levels, thereby providing energy to the individual cells. Now, your beta cells will do the opposite. Your beta cells will be releasing insulin. And insulin is usually secreted during or after a meal as your body is chewing and digesting the food and breaking down the carbohydrates into glucose, simple sugar. The insulin is released. And what the insulin will do is it will interact with the target cells to allow the absorption of the glucose. Thereby, the glucose leaves the bloodstream and ends enters the individual cells, where it can then be used for metabolic actions such as cellular respiration and obviously things like ATP productions. So if you think about it, insulin and glucogen are antagonistic from each other. They have opposite reactions. The end result of glucogen is to increase your blood insulin level. The end reaction of insulin is to decrease your insulin level. And the reason insulin is so important is because not all cells are able to absorb glucose by themselves. So insulin provides almost like a pathway or a connection point to allow the glucose to enter into the individual cell so that its nutritional and energy demands can be met. Now, I inserted the question that says, do all cells require insulin? And the answer is no. There are a certain organs that do not rely on it. So as you can see on your PowerPoint, I went ahead and highlighted the fact that the brain, the liver, your kidneys, and your red blood cells are able to absorb glucose all by themselves. All remaining cells in the body do need that insulin to link the glucose from the outside to the inside of the cell. And if there is an issue with that insulin and glucose transport, then will then lead us to diabetes, which we will be discussing in the next part of our lecture. Finishing off, we have our delta cells. Delta cells are going to produce somatostatin. Somatostatin is going to be a hormone that actually will inhibit both glucogen and insulin. So it also is an antagonistic reaction, and in this case, it will suppress the secretions from both the alpha and the beta cells. 
There's a bunch of research that's being done on somatostatin, and they're not really sure about its complete mechanism of action, but most research does indicate that its release and the fact that it can suppress the glucogen and insulin secretion will tend to allow the cells a more prolonged time to actually absorb the nutrients that are inside of the bloodstream. So we do see that it might have to do with maximizing the amount of nutrient that can be absorbed from our meals. Now, to finish off the pancreas, um, you're going to notice that I put a little red line in the middle of our PowerPoint, and that's because I just wanted to kind of switch topics real quick and show you the terminology that we're going to use to indicate blood glucose levels. So if you see a mention of hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic, both of them will reference sugar levels, hence the glycemic part. Hyperglycemic means that you're looking at something that increases your sugar levels. So things like gluconogen, epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol, anything that's going to give your body that extra boost of glucose, of sugar in its bloodstream, usually it has to do with increased um, activity or it has to do with activating the sympathetic nervous system, such as your fight and fl uh, flight response, that will have a hyperglycemic effect. A hypoglycemic drug will be a drug or, or I should say a hypoglycemic hormone will be a hormone that will lower your blood glucose. And in this case so far, we've only discussed insulin because as I mentioned to you before, insulin will interact with the target cells to allow glucose to transport itself from the bloodstream into the individual cells mechanism. The end part of the endocrine or glands will take us over to the gonads, where we're going to take a look at the ovaries and the testes. And as a quick reminder, both of these are examples of a mixed glands. And the reason for that is that the ovaries produce an oocyte, an egg, and your testes produce sperm. Both of these will travel through a duct and um, end up in an opening, quote-unquote, aka making that an exocrine secretion. On the other hand, both ovaries and testes will discuss in the sense that they can also secrete um, estrogen and testosterone. Those will always travel in the bloodstream looking for their target cells, making that an endocrine secretion. So let's look at each gonad individually, and we'll take a look at the estrogen in the ovaries, the testosterone in the testes, and we'll also discuss this other hormone that both of them secrete, which is called inhibin. So let's take a look at our ovaries. Now, please take a look at the illustration that's on the right-hand side of the PowerPoint. And if you look at the bottom, you're going to know an illustrated um, example of what your ovaries look like. And inside the ovaries, we have follicles. And that's the bigger picture that's above it. Now, the follicle will be the functioning unit of the ovaries. Um, women are born with all the follicles that they'll have, that they'll utilize for the rest of their life. Um, when you're born, the follicles are very small. And as you go through puberty, what we see happening is it starts activating the maturity of the follicle. So every month, a handful of what they call primordial follicles, which are the smallest versions, will start to mature. And when they mature, that means they're increasing in size and they start to develop the oocyte, the little egg, the little light pink circle you see inserted it within the image. Now, the main purpose of this is to get at least one follicle to the finish line each month so that you can have one egg that will ovulate. In fact, at the bottom where you have your illustrated ovary, notice how at the bottom of the right-hand corner you have a little oocyte, a little egg that's being released, and that is then ovulation. The egg will then travel in the fallopian tube where it will eventually make its way over to the uterus. Now, for our endocrine system, what we see happening is that we're going to rely very heavily on different versions of estrogen. So let's start off by take, talking about the granulosa cells. The granulosa cells basically fall, uh, form the perimeter around the follicle. You can see it bracketed and labeled on our illustration. And the granulosa cells will be our main source of estrogen for the follicle. And it will help with the maturity of the oocyte.
We also see that once the oocyte is released, the follicle will go ahead and switch over and start producing progesterone, which is another variation of estrogen. At this time when the follicle has released its oocyte, we start calling it a corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is a follicle without the oocyte because it has been ovulated. And the corpus luteum will secrete progesterone for the next 12 days or so. And this progesterone is uh, signaling the uterus that there is a potential oocyte that might be fertilized coming its way and a pregnancy might follow. So the uterus will go ahead and start to thicken its endometrium lining in the response. After the 12 days, we see that the progesterone levels stop, and what happens is that the corpus luteum will go ahead and shrivel up and will be known as the corpus albicans. Corpus albicans is nothing but scar tissue that will remain in the ovaries for the rest of your lifetime. We'll touch up more about the development of the follicles um, when we do our reproductive chapters. For now, just please keep in mind that you need your estrogen from your granulosa cells to help mature the oocyte and that your corpus luteum secretes your progesterone to signal the uterus to start thickening. We also see that the ovaries will produce this hormone called inhibin. Inhibin will suppress your follicle stimulating hormone when you are actively um, maturing an oocyte already and that will guarantee that there's only one egg each month that ovulates. Um, obviously this is not a perfect system and some women will have multiple eggs, some will have no eggs at all, but in a perfect world what we would see is that you would stimulate high levels of follicle stimulating hormone when you're actively trying to develop the oocyte and as the oocyte is released you want the follicle stimulating hormone to go down to allow for that oocyte to finish its journey before you start all over again and that is where inhibin comes in and suppresses your FSH. We also see that you have inhibin making an appearance in the testes. But before we get to that, let's take a look at their functioning units. So on the illustration on the right, you can see that within the testes, you have these structures called seminiferous tubules. And the seminiferous tubules will be the functioning units of the testes. That is where the sperm cells are being produced and released. And we also see that there are a wide variety of different cells that are labeled. So go ahead and identify your nurse cells. You can see they're towards the edge. Your nurse cells are also going to be called your serotoli cells. Um, they are going to go ahead and secrete inhibit. You also want to find your lydic cell, aka your interstitial cells. Remember, interstitial means outside of the follicle. And those interstitial or lydic cells are going to be helping with the production of testosterone. Now, your testosterone will help with the, the development of the male reproductive system, the sex drive, the maintenance, but it will also be important in sustaining sperm production. So what we see happening is, is that it will be a delicate balance between your testosterone and how much sperm you produce and if you release inhibin. Inhibin comes in if it sees that the sperm numbers start increasing dramatically because it turns out that the more sperm a man produces, the more likely it is that the quality becomes diminished. So inhibin will regulate your FSH and LH secretion, and as the end result, it will help regulate the sperm production for a man. So it will keep the numbers in check, thereby guaranteeing that the quality of the sperm produced is high. All right, guys, that seems to be the end of our lecture. Oh, actually, my apologies. I completely forgot the question that's at the bottom. It says, what exactly do germ cells do? So you can see the germ cells are also labeled. Germ cells are actually versions of stem cells. Um, sperm production is based from a germ cell line or a stem cell line, which means that till his dying day, a man will be able to produce sperm cells. Ladies, unfortunately, we are born with all the follicles that we'll have. So we won't be producing any new follicles anytime soon. We do mature them. And don't worry, you're, you're born with thousands upon thousands of follicles. You will never run out of them, even if you live to be 300 plus years old. So don't stress it. So guys, hands up to your germ cells and making those cells until your dying day. See
Jessie. See you for the next lecture.